Hello everybody and welcome to this week's Twice Removed. I'm Natalie, I'm a family historian and I run a club called the Curious Descendants Club which is all about tracing and writing your family history um, and I'm joined here today with Mish. Hi Mish, would you mind introducing Hello. yourself? Hello, I'm Mish Holman, I'm a professional genealogist and I have been researching my family tree since 1984, went professional in 1998 actually 1996, started my business in 98. And for many years I've been doing theatrical research and very Great. enjoyable it is. <laughs> I bet. Um, and so, <laughs> so I have to ask um, a really important question. So when we were having our pre-chat, you said to me, um, that we've all got theatrical ancestors in one way or another. And um, I found that really intriguing and I thought that might be a good place to start. Yeah, I, I think so. I've been thinking about this for quite a long while. And it came up in an article recently and I was trying to describe our ancestors in theatrical space and how that they were really theatrical ancestors as theatre goers. We think of them not being and possibly able to go to the theatre because they were uh, not on not very good wages and perhaps they didn't have the time because they were working all the time, but they were actually given the chance to go occasionally. And there's also this definition of what theatre ancestor is. And for many people probably watching this will instantly think of actor, dancer, musician, singer. Those are all the things that come to people's minds. Others may expand that and think theatre manager, playwright. But then there's all these other connected professions, such as the prompter, the scene shifter, there was the mantua maker, the milliner, box office keeper, there was this, um, carpenters, plumbers, plasterers, all sorts of professions that pro that serviced and provided the theatre with all of its needs. So I think of them as theatre ancestors as well. I like that. <laughs> I do, and I think that we probably got carpenters out there that would have done some work and we would never have known about it. And that includes all those small travelling companies that would come to our villages and our smaller towns. And they'd say, well, we need some help assembling a stage in a barn or on top, top gallery of an inn or something like that. They would, they would want that help from our, our ancestors. But I think I also mentioned to you that there was an element that many people would probably never think about, and that is going back quite a number of centuries to the medieval period. We talk of, about the Christian era just after the collapse of the Roman Empire and when the church was looking at ways of pushing pagan festivities out of the calendar and they come across the idea that using theatre to teach Christian values and morals was a way to go. Didn't catch on at first but then suddenly they, they thought well we can really capture this idea and it also pushes out those individuals that had bad reputations and where the church wanted to take hold of the morals of their flock. Right? So when you get into 10th, 11th century, we've got our ancestors' spiritual life in the theatre. They would have taken part in cycles and religious plays where there were allegories and lots of different types of teaching and they all would have played their parts. They I'm would not, have been involved in it. I'm imagining a lot less jazzy version of Jesus Christ Superstar medieval <laughs> style. Yeah, I think so. I think so. <laughs> I think that they would have really con concentrated on the, on the, all the allegories and metaphors. And, but they could be quite lewd. Okay. They could there are lots of uh, references to devil's anatomy and, 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 and stuff like that. So we know that the theatre was part of our ancestors' spiritual life at that point. 
And what happened a bit later was that when the Guild Company started, they were kind of overlapped with what the church was doing. And then they took over preparing and putting on these religious plays. So all the company members, they would have been there, again, all the carpenters and the, and the seamen and the, the fishmongers and the blacksmiths, they would have all to add their part in these plays. So that's my argument, that we've all got an ancestor who would have been performing at some point, because it was part of their spiritual life. Well, I, I, I quite like that because I think that storytelling is such an integral part of what makes us human that it, it kind of mm -hmm. makes sense to me that something like theatre would have those kind of uh, roots where everybody's involved in it in one, one way or another. And um, yeah, I like that. I, I, I'll agree. <laughs> what do you think about the church service? The church service is quite mm -hmm. a theatrical spe spectacle. Church space itself is the theatre. And then at during that period, there was that type of singing that was um, one person singing and the other person answering. And then there's all the vestments and all the colour. And of course, we know that it was aimed at people who couldn't read. And and those other plays that I was talking about, the medic where all the villagers and town folk took part, they could learn through the visual elements of the play. Yeah, make, no, it makes a lot of sense. Okay. Well, before I launch into my questions about the 18th century, I just wanted to remind anyone that if you do have any comments and you want to comment or ask a question, please feel free to um, to type in the box and um, I'll bring them up on screen. Um, so what first sparked, you've obviously got a real passion for theatrical ancestors. And so what, what kind of sparked that passion? Have you got theatrical ancestors in your own family tree or yes my great grandfather he was a musician and he spent quite a lot of his adult working life at the Hackney Empire in London so he was the first person and there was some mystery about how he learned to be a musician because he, he was illegitimate he came from quite a poor background and turned out he was at Centre Industrial School and then into the army. And both these places were really good bases for people learning music. And the same with children's homes. And that again, they believed that performance and music could teach individuals, it could teach them discipline and strong character and so on. So if anyone out, out there has a musician in their family and they're not sure how they got to learn an instrument and music, then I think that is a route to explore. Were, was that person in an industrial school or was they in a children's home or in the army? Yeah, I've I've got a client at the moment who I've just found out was a bugler in the Navy um, as a very young boy. And um, I can't wait to ask him whether it was his father, actually. And I I'm, I'm, can't wait to ask him whether he, whether he knew that, whether his yeah. father carried on the bugling later in life. <laughs> yeah, so... Okay, so um, so that find is that 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 discovery of that um, musician in your family is that what then sparked your interest in all these different elements of theatrical history? Part of it, but as you can see, I concentrate on the eighteenth. So I was looking at my three times grandmother's side, and she left a will, and in that will, she said that she was going to leave. A sculptured model of her uncle Adcock. So this really intrigued me because I thought, well, Henrietta was born 1754, so her uncle was clearly a generation before at least. So a sculptured model of someone born 1720, 1730 was quite unusual. And I knew about companies such as the Bow Porcelain Company and how they produced models of celebrities, mainly, of people that were performers, musicians, actors and so on. So I actually went round looking for a person that fitted. <laughs> and I think I said to you that this, folks, is a really bad way to research. <laughs> you should follow the evidence and not fit the person into the jigsaw piece. 
But I did it and what I, I was very careful about what I did. And I, I, I stumbled upon, upon this chap, Abraham Adcock, who was Handel's last trumpeter. And he kept living a couple of streets away from my family. And I thought, oh, he's a good person to examine. So I went and did a lot of research for him and discovered that lots of people had gone before trying to find out about him. Because he was an important person in Handel's life, that last decade or so. And in the end, I thought, this is so fascinating and so compelling. I don't care if he's related. I really don't care. I just want to carry on with him. And of course, then I started looking at other Adcocks as well. So I started looking at Sarah Adcock, who features quite largely on my website too. So the, yeah, that's, that's what led me down this particular trail into the 18th century. And I loved the 18th century before that. It's my favourite. Okay. Favourite century. <laughs> It's like my equivalent of the Victorians then. <laughs> yeah, I like Victorians as well, but I just feel the 18th edges it for me. No, yeah, it's so funny because my mum's favourite is the is the Georgians, and we we have quite yeah, regular yeah, yeah, yeah. regular debates about why why our favourite period is the best. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, so how um, so how important was theatre as a form of entertainment for people in the 18th century? Um, you know, you mentioned before about uh, lots of people being involved, but, uh, you know, I think I tend to presume, or I certainly presume that it was something that you went to if you were wealthy, um, but you quite quickly disillusioned me of that belief when we, were, <laughs> when we yeah. were chatting and I wondered if you could elaborate. Yeah, it attracted every single class and they all mixed. Okay. People weren't weren't confined to one place in the theatre if they were low class or they were upper class. And I think part of the fascination was it was one of the few places where they did all mix together and they could all view one another. And yet again, it was another learning space. You learned from all the people that you saw. And in some ways, they were also part of the spectacle themselves. I was reading earlier about one chap who was sitting in the pit. Now, the pit was really mainly for the professional classes. They, that's what they were drawn to. They didn't necessarily have to sit there. But he stood up in the middle of King Lear and he, and he whinnied. That's what, <laughs> that's, that's what he did. stood up and he whinnied. Okay. <laughs> and I thought, well, given the amount of times I've seen King Lear, and I don't know why I put myself through it, because there's not one character who's endearing at all. <laughs> I would get up and win it. <laughs> so people like to turn the attention on themselves and have conversations with people in the boxes and di great distance away. So it was it was a, a place where equal people felt equals. And I suppose for our ancestors that didn't have a huge amount of money, they wouldn't have gone that often, but it was one of the few recreations they could go to. And I suppose that their time, they made the most of their time there when they, when they could go. Yeah, and you were saying to me about servants um, reserving seats and having to sit until their until their um, masters came, yeah. which, which made a lot of sense, actually. And I suppose that's one of the very few perks of the jobs. <laughs> yeah, it was. I mean, they got bed and board, and, but they were paid a lot low, lower than their equivalent. But yeah, that was one of the things that when the doors open, they'd all rush in because nobody had reserved seats okay. as we think of today. Okay. So was it a bit of a bun fight then? Who got the best seats? Yeah, it was. It, it was absolutely because there weren't seats as such, they were benches. Okay. So nobody sat in a nice seat. Can you imagine sitting there for five hours on a bench? Yeah. And they were given twenty-one inches. That's the space that they were given on the on the, on the bench. And if you had a big dress on, you imagine you're quite packed in tightly. Yeah, really. And I think to myself, well, that tells me quite a lot about at Georgian attitudes to personal space. That they didn't mind all that. I didn't mind all that crush and being close to strangers. Yeah, well, that was part of the excitement, maybe, of going to the theatre. 
that awesome. it was a, a rare occasion when you could legitimately brush up against somebody. <laughs> yeah, and you could really let your hair down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Be a bit loose in your ways. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so like, talk me through. So nowadays, if we start from the beginning, I want to yeah. go for a show. I find out yeah. about it on mm -hmm. Facebook. And then mm -hmm. I click a link and I go online and I buy my ticket. Or if I lived locally, maybe I'd pop down to the local theatre and go to the box office and pick, buy my ticket well in advance. Um, and, um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd um, pay for it there and then and, and reserve my seat. So you've already mentioned the reserving seats was different. But what about the buying of the tickets? Is that obviously they didn't have the Internet, but was it similar? You'd buy your tickets well in advance or? No, because they didn't know until the day before what was about to be performed. So on the day before the performance, all the playbills would be printed and they would go out. And they'd be put in in the theatre window and they'd go to coffee houses and pubs and then they would be nailed to posts. And for some of the players, if they were having a benefit, they would have them on display in their windows in their lodging houses. So no, uh, nobody really knew until that point. And there was also the newspaper announcement that would go out the same day. So I've shared with you a copy. Mm, do you want me to bring it up on screen? Yeah, playbill okay. side by side okay. with the newspaper. So for, so for anyone who's listening to this in the future on yes. Audible, I will put this, this <laughs> on Audible, on a I'm Audible version. To <laughs> I will um, pop it on um, on the blog post. So hang on, let me just share my yeah. screen. I'll see, yeah. should I make that a little bit bigger and just disappear? Our faces? So what we're looking at for anyone who can't see is a playbill from the time. And I'll hand yeah. over to you, Mish. <laughs> so the one on the left is the playbill. So we'll tackle that first. And we can see it's at Covent Garden in 1775. And with a lot of these playbills, I think this is similar. Though in this case, we can see what's being performed. Now, don't you think it is quite hard? It's, it's, it's quite, quite hard to read because all the it letters, is. for anyone who can't yeah. see it, all the letters are really, really spaced out. So it's got like people's names, like Mr. Woodward, but yeah. there's big spaces between the W and the O and then the next O, which yeah. are... So they, they're they're the names. that actually makes it quite hard to read. It is. I mean, they're filling up as much space as possible. But the people's names are almost as big as the plays and the little farce at the end there that they're performing in. So we can take from that that actually the performers themselves are quite important. Yeah. And possibly more important than, than the play itself. We've also got with this one... Prologue and epilogue. We've got those because it was a new play. And so with the prologue, someone would come out, probably would be a male with the prologue, and he would, it would be especially written for the occasion. And in many ways, he would be kind of taunting the audience <laughs> with this work. And I, I, it's quite playful, but it was really to get them engaged. The epilogue, at the end, tended to be by a female. Underneath that, we have with new scenes and dresses. Now, this is also quite important because for a lot of the plays from this era, they were repeated over and over again. This is because of the licensing act. And so the repertoire was quite small. They didn't actually commission a lot of new plays because of the, this licensing act. So they've only got these ones uh, that would come out occasionally. So to tempt people, new costumes, new scenes, scenery, that brings people in because they were so fed up with seeing the same thing over and over again. And also the actors would be the same people playing the same parts. I don't know, once you've got a part, you've almost got it for life. Yeah, I learned that the other day. And it was an earlier period. I was listening to um, 
Greg Jenner's brilliant podcast, You're Dead to Me, You're Dead to Me, and they had an episode on Nell Gwyn, and it went into theatre history quite a lot. And as I really recommend it. It was a really good listen. I learned a lot. But yeah, they were saying back in that period as well that once you got a part, you performed it over and over again, and then <laughs> it's really aged <laughs> Hamlet that people just you know understand is just desperately waiting for you to pop their slugs so they can exactly. get the part. <laughs> That's exactly what happened to, um, there was a role called Polly Honeycomb, a player the same name, and she was a teenager obsessed with novels. So this was quite advanced in itself because novels were were a new medium at this point. And the lady that played her did play her when she was a teenager, but then she was still playing her when she was 37. <laughs> <laughs> it's like those actors in like Neighbours and Home and Away and like kind of Australian dramas and, and teenage dramas and you're looking at thinking they're not 16 at school <laughs> yeah. yeah that's right that's right uh, so, um, um, sorry I was just going to say Sue, Sue has popped up to say I have alleged theatrical theatrical ancestors my grandfather was supposed to have performed in a musical um, something about oh am I going to say this Gilbert yeah. and Sullivan. Mm. Okay. No idea if there's anything in the garble tales. Well, we'll 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 give you some tips at the end, Sue, um, on on how you might be able to untangle whether it's a garble tale or not. But um, okay, so you've you've gone and got your ticket right at the last minute to go see a show. Yeah, and so and the ticket would be available from all sorts of places. So they'd be inns and coffee shops and so so on. So you've okay. gone and got it. You'd have to make sure that you got to the theatre early enough to, to get this seat, or you'd be pushed in like sardines somehow. And then the first thing that would happen, there would be a curtain, curtain would go up. Then the house servants came on and they'd light chandeliers and, and other sconce, lamp sconces. And that would be the lighting for the whole of the show. It doesn't get dimmed, it just stays on the, the whole time. Then the main piece starts, which would be something like the rivals. And the actors would be standing towards the front of the stage. There wouldn't be very many props, if any. There would just be backdrops. And they had scenery that was that ran on grooves on the side of the stage, and that would be pushed in if they wanted to change the scene. And they would change the scene in full view of everyone. So all the scene shifters would come on and but everyone was sitting there talking. So it really didn't matter. <laughs> they weren't really paying much attention. So all, all these things would carry on right in front of the audience. And that, that thing standing right at the front of the stage meant that the actors were right in the face of the audience, but the audience were right in the face of the actors. It must have been quite intimidating, mm. particularly when the audience threw things at the actors. So in The Rivals, there, you can see on there there's an actor called Mr. Lee, who played a character that everybody hated so much, a bit like King Lear for me, um, hated so much that they threw an apple at him. I was reading it earlier, and he turned mad and he said, is it something personal? <laughs> <laughs> or, is it something personal or is it the matter as in in the play? Well, I think it was a bit of, a bit of both, you know. <laughs> so that they were... They were um, yeah, they were right at the vanguard of all the nasty stuff when they were right at the front of the stage. So then there would be the, the intervals between the acts. And you may ask me about music. And they would have a seven-minute interval between all these acts in the first main piece. Okay. And during that seven-minute interval, either the orchestra would play or someone would come on and do a song and a dance. Okay. Okay. And did you get snacks during the interval? You could. Snacks to throw at the actors. <laughs> um, or, is it oranges, apples? I was reading there was beer and there were nuts. Okay. I was just going to stop in a moment. Okay. Drink. Now, after the main piece, I say, we get the epilogue if it wasn't a new play. Yeah. After the nine nights, I think you remember... People got play, paid after the third night, the sixth night, and the ninth night. After the ninth night, the prologue didn't tend to, an epilogue didn't tend to carry on unless they were really popular and because okay. they were often printed in the press. They didn't care. Then they would have an interval and 
there was often a lot of dancing and singing in this in this interval. And a lot of the time it was the children. One of my people that I've been researching for years, Sarah Radcock, I mentioned her earlier, one of her earliest engagements was as a dan little dancer at Drury Lane when she was must have been about five, six or seven. So they would all come on. She danced hornpipe. This was quite a popular interval entertainment was the hornpipe. Okay. In the 1760s. Then they would have something called an afterpiece, <clears throat> which was generally a farce. And we can see it on those, uh, on the playbill and on the newspaper advert. And I think I remember reading something that they generally lasted about 20 minutes. And sometimes the actors doubled up. So you would have them playing in the rivals and then they'd quickly have to come out again and play in the afterpiece as well. And then this would all end about 11 o'clock. So it would start at 6, end at 11 p.m., which point the prompter would come out and say, well, tomorrow we're doing such and such. And the theatre manager would be in the wings and he would be listening to the audience's reaction. If they all cheered, it'd go ahead. And if they went, no, 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 no. You'd have to quickly think of something else. <laughs> so I think a lot of people were made to stay to the, to the end to find out just what was going to be the next piece that was going to be on that theatre. It kind of gives you that, that sense of a buzz, you know, because like, I think you get a buzz about the theatre now, don't you? But imagine oh, not yeah. knowing. Yeah. And would you, would people have dressed up particularly to go to the theatre? Would it have been a, yes. a, a, an occasion? The celebs did. And the, okay. the celebs would have been the other actresses. A bit, uh, there was a, a uh, actress called Mary Robinson. She was a big celebrity. And she did have a rivalry in 1783 with my Sarah. And they was always competing with one another. So they were the ones that turned up in the big hair and all the feathers and the headdresses. And uh, the gentlemen would have been in their rich brocade coats. But I think the other classes would have just turned up in their normal gear because they would have probably didn't have an awful lot, lot of alternatives. Yeah, and looked at all the other people in their finery. I'm and they all looked at it yeah. and seen what the latest fashion was. And... Yes, and who they were with. Yeah. Who they were with. Okay. Yeah, that it, it seemed that seems very Georgian to me. <laughs> yeah, definitely, it was very much an era of look at me, wasn't it? Mm, yeah, definitely. Um, so, so um, where you mentioned about where you'd sit, and you said that the legal um, people tended to sit in the pits. What what exactly is the pits? Is that the, the like the stall? That is the bit right in front of the stage. Right in front. Okay. Right in front okay. Of the stage. Okay. So you would also have the more richer classes up in the boxes and they were paying about five shillings for a box there and then. But I think I mentioned in one of my articles that they were subscription boxes as well, so people paid for a longer period. Then there was the first gallery, which was for really for the middle class. I think they paid about three shillings for that. Okay. And then the, the upper gallery where the servants were and everyone else was about one shilling. Okay. It's quite but a big people didn't stick to, Yeah, people didn't stick to those areas. They moved about. Depending on what they could afford. So to be quite a successful actor in that period, you, to be able to captivate people's attention when you've got people you know, eating, talking, having conversations, presumably smoking potentially as well, getting up, moving and all that kind of thing, shouting out. You must have had a real talent if you managed to, you know, really hold people's interest and um, and also just be convincing and, and captivate them and transform them to King Lear or, <laughs> or whatever play you were playing or the rival. Um, Don't get me wrong, I love Shakespeare, but that play, <laughs> and I do get to say, I punish myself with it frequently. Um yeah, yeah, I, I think that there were, for a lot of the people seeing the females, there were other attractions because they were novelties. They wouldn't have seen females dressed and performing 
in, in, to, in display that much as they would in normal life, as they would see okay. in the theatre. So I think it was quite easy for many of the females to kind of captivate their audience. And there was also quite a lot of symbolism going on, which I think many, particularly in the 19th century, many of the female actresses had no idea that they, they were doing these things. They were sending out messages, sex, sexual messages to the audience. Hmm. For some of the, the male players, we know that Garrick had something and he just ran with it. That was quite clear that David Garrick was someone of, of exceptional ability. And because he he changed theatre, changed theatre in, in a way that made it much more natural instead of just standing there and gesticulating. So who, who was David Garrick? David Garrick was probably the premier actor of the 18th century. He was also a theatre manager and he also wrote plays. But I suppose he was actually more of an adapter of plays than an original playwright. So, yes, he, and he just changed the way people acted on stage because they would have been very still and they would have just stood there and not moved about that much. Whereas he created an energy by being more natural and moving about the stage and um, creating sort of this atmosphere that was captivating people couldn't take their eyes from. And did they, did they, do we know if they interacted with the audience? You know, you mentioned about oh, yeah. um, the comment. Do you say, could you be in the middle oh, yeah. of, um, you know, to be or not to be and suddenly get interrupted and turn around and say, <laughs> Oh, yes. You know. And I think I mean, there's several arguments and people walking off stage and being abused. And of course, as I said, audience throwing stuff on. I'm not too sure that they were that great at, at ignoring it as actors are trained these days. Oh, there were so many incidents in the theatre, so, so many between the actors and um, and the audience. Because at times, well, before Gary tried, he tried to stop it once and he, he failed, and then he made a second attempt and he succeeded. Many members of the audience actually sat on the stage with them as they were performing. So they, I, I've actually been to a production where they emulated this and they've had these these little galleries on the stage with and the, the boxes and people sitting there and that's how it was and a lot of people went just for that so that they could be on stage with their favorite actor oh, it sell it for me. <laughs> the distraction well why he didn't like it because they were always off talking to someone else and parading up and down okay. makes a lot of sense so so were was being an act, especially I'm thinking especially of female actors was being an actor seen as a respectable profession or an uh, 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 an unrespectable profession or or a kind of weird hybrid depending on how successful you were I think that for a few of it was a hybrid I think Sarah Siddons was an exception but she worked so hard on it and given the fact that she had to work hard on having this pure reputation would suggest that it was very different for other actresses, that they had that they had these reputations that followed them around, even though some may not necessarily have done very much wrong, many others did. Okay. And for centuries, the whole profession, particularly for females, was tainted by this idea of women working and being on display for money. It was always associated with prostitution and there were courtesans within the theatre. So Sidin, what Siddons did was quite kind of exceptional in a way in that she created her own reputation and she tried to be a good wife and mother. And this came out in the newspaper reports. And when I was studying her and I was studying Sarah Adcock, but they were friends and they'd worked together, they'd worked together in Liverpool. But you would have paragraphs side by side saying how wonderful Siddons was as a mother and one that was really quite nasty about Sarah as a mother. And it struck me that newspaper columns were quite 
kind of out to get a lot of the actresses. They probably didn't do themselves any favours by their behaviour. But if you're kind of excluded from society already, because people think, well, you, you must be depraved, then you're probably going to think, to hell with it, I'm going to do that anyway. I'm that yeah, kind of yeah, person, yeah, yeah. personality where I am kind of rebellious and unconventional, so I'm going to do my own, own thing. I'm going to have five husbands and a child with each husband. I'm going to court an earl, as Sarah did, and hope to live off his largesse for the rest of my life. And sadly, she didn't. So what, what sort of people became actors or actresses? How did, how did one go about becoming an actor? For her, she was born into a theatrical family, and I think this is, this is the same for many of them. And I've been working on this for quite a while. I've got a hereditary theatrical family trees project going on on my site, and I haven't done much work to it. But even with the ones on there, you can see how many generations were already in the theatre, in various roles within the theatre. And this course went on into the 19th century. For those wanting to enter theatre for the first time, and if, say, if the, the travelling company come to their village or their town, they would seek out the theatre manager because they had all the power in those days as to who gets hired and who, who didn't get hired. And they would find him possibly in the tavern, having a drink, go up to him, and he would ask them what roles they knew and how many lines or lengths they were called. How many lengths did you know, do you know, from such and such a production? And a length was 42 lines. Okay. Because of rep the 18th century theatre being mainly repertory, these pe people had to learn 70 roles, perhaps. And they would be performing them at the drop of hat, as we just discussed, but they would only be announced the day before. So it did help you to already know some of the roles before you got into the, the theatre company. So that, in general, was their background. Okay. I think many people also had other jobs. I don't because I don't think that theatre could sustain a lot of them the whole time. So they would have been artisans. They might have been artisans coming into it, book publishers and and so on. Okay. So how it's did you I know it's quite difficult to do a kind of wage comparison, but how did you get paid? You mentioned that you had you got paid on the third, so the third, the sixth, and the ninth night. So what happened if for some reason your show got cancelled, or you know, as, as I'm guessing it's different to you know today you're committed and you've got a salary, or but yeah, you didn't get paid. And some of the people that wrote their stories at the time, they, these are really enlightening. It's worth seeking out the memoirs and the diaries. They may not altogether be accurate. People embellish things, but they give a real insight into their lives. And one diary said people just went without, that they were emaciated. And when they did get money, they spent it on drink and tobacco. They weren't very disciplined people. Yeah, well, I guess if you're having a hard time there, it's an escape, isn't it? You would console yeah, yourself in those things. Yeah. I did write down here, because I can't remember the wages, because they were so wide, wide so broad. Mm. So I've got them written down on my notes, i just find it. I, I know that for some of the big actors with the big theatres, so Covent Garden, Drury Lane, that they could earn £25 a week. And that's a lot. Is, that's a lot. And further down the scale, there were, so say ones that were moderately successful, you get about six pounds a week. Okay. And there were differences between the men and the women. Men of generally course. got paid more. 
And I suppose you must have had people who were just putting on an amateur, what we might call Amdram today, you know, putting on an amateur production for a very small village once or twice a year, um, you know, as a, as a hobby. Like, you know, we have that today, so I'm presuming it would be in the same or similar back then. Yeah. And, you know, that was probably a bit more respected because they didn't earn money from it. If they were if they were just doing it out of enjoyment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking about doing, volunteering to put on a play for the elderly or um, my my great grand used to put on plays at the local hospital, you know, so that kind of th equivalent. Um, you know, I've not heard of that. Oh, OK. It doesn't mean to say it didn't happen. OK. It doesn't mean to say it didn't happen. I'm sure it did. I'm sure people did put. We know that they did private theatricals. These were the big families that put, mm. had private theatricals in the big houses and uh, for their friends and associates, but I presume and I'm pretty sure that they actually did pay the performers. You know, okay. the performers. And why would you if somebody's got all that money and yeah. you're doing something specifically for them? You want to get paid. So, what were some of the more what were some of the, what were some of the most popular productions that were going on in the 18th century? I think probably one of the biggest was the Beggar's Opera. Okay. It was, at that period, it came out in the 1720s, the second longest, it had the second longest run, which I think was 62 nights. So they did get quite well. I, they didn't have to worry about the night getting to the <laughs> ninth night. Did they? 62 yeah, consecutive nights. And because it was fairly unique as a ballad opera, I think it was the first English ballad opera, which was a satire as well and it's so worth watching you know and go if you can go and see one of these plays that were, that were popular at the time because you get this view of 18th century life it is the same as reading Shakespeare to understand life in the 16th century yeah there would have been differences and there was a quite a lot of embellishments and if we, we think talking about the rivals and that there was some lud the ludicrous uh, plots <laughs> but even so we're still getting an idea of what life was like if we read the plays and especially if we go and see them because obviously they're meant to be seen rather than read yeah, no, absolutely. I completely agree. And um, I think my introduction to history came from doing my English degree. So I am. Um, I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that was what I'd, I'd done history A level and actually hated it and really struggled. I was already doing my family tree and I loved doing that, but I didn't associate it with history, history, history. which is it's strange, interesting when I look back. Mm. Yeah, it was when something start, different. Start looking at our families in context, when that penny drops that we should be looking at families in context, mm. that's when we start thinking, oh yeah, this is history. Yeah. yeah maybe absolutely. we should be paying more attention to history <laughs> in general. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that learning about history of the theatre and the licensing helps us understand those theatrical ancestors and what oh, they were up against. Having to learn all those plays because they were forever doing the old ones because the old ones had already got past the censor and they didn't want to have to commission new ones because it may not get past the censor and they've, they've spent money on on a new play and what's more the theatre managers thought I haven't got to play the pay the playwright because he's dead he's long yeah. dead yeah. if we're, we're performing all this restoration drama they were quite savvy people and they were quite astute the theatre managers well they've been yeah. charlatans at times well, they, <laughs> they know. and it was actually a real proper profession in the 18th century and when the 1840, 1843 act, theatre act came about and it just opened up theatre to, to everyone lots of people became theatre managers and they didn't have a clue if you go through the papers you will see a lot of theatre managers in bankruptcy it's worth going and having a look. That's a great tip. So generally, if you found a theatrical ancestor, um, what would your first steps be to kind of find out more about them? 
depends on the period. Okay. In, in the so 18th it, century, I mean. It yeah. is in the 18th century. My go-to source, because you asked me last night and I was so tired I couldn't remember it, is something called a biographical dictionary of actors. It's in about 13 volumes and it's on the Happy Trust, completely free to view. It is the most marvellous resource and it is extremely comprehensive. It doesn't just cover actors. It covers everyone that worked in the theatre. So all those people that we mentioned earlier, in, this, in particular, the scene shifters and the prompters and the box office keepers and all those people that did that behind the scene work, they're covered there as well. And one of my favourite jobs is the scene painter and the machinist. Scene painter and the machinist often did the same same work. Do you know what machinists did? No. <laughs> no. They were the people responsible for the special effects. Okay. So they were the ones that designed and they knew about all the pulley system and creating chariots flying across the sky and so on. That's, that's one of my favourite jobs. And you find them frequently listed in the biographical dictionary of actors. Okay, I, but that's that's a really interesting role. I wonder how many, I don't know, clockmakers and people who worked with mechanisms yeah, and things found yes, their way into those roles. There would have been quite a lot of those that would have transferred into that profession. Yeah. So this is a thirteen-volume set, as I say, it's okay. quite, quite comprehensive. It's not very well cited, so you have to find your way with whatever they do cite. Then there are my second source, which is newspapers. And for the 18th century, there's not an awful lot on British newspaper archive at the moment. Where I found most of my sources is in the Burney collection, which is at the British Library. Okay. I also used Gal 18th century resources, again, not easily accessible, but I got them from the British Library. And there are wheels, there are theatre calendars. And the theatre calendars, they're, they're kind of all over the place. You can find them on Google Books, you can find them on Internet Archive and Happy Trust. And if you're wondering what theatre calendar is, it, it lists all the performances that have ever occurred in a particular theatre during time period. So the one for the, the London stage, which covers a number of theatres, such as Drury Lane, Covent Garden and the Little Hay, starts from 17th century and goes through right up to 1800. So you can find everyone listed, every play listed and everyone that performed listed. And also some independent performers, female musicians that played shows, come over here and did small performances, they're listed on there as well. So worth a lot. Keep in mind that most people were only listed under their surname. Yeah. Okay. And if you if you've heard a story that you might have theatrical ancestors, what clues could you look for that might might indicate to you that somebody might have been involved in the theatre? I would look for people turning up in places right across the country. So Chase if they look like they're very mobile. It possibly means that they're performing in wherever they can find work. In the 18th century, it's quite important to keep in mind that there was a season in London and in the patent theatres, and that ran from September through to May. Then the house went dark for the summer season. So what performers did was that they then went off to the regional circuits, and so that a circuit would be a collection of theatres in one area. There was one in York. There was York, Leeds, Richmond, Wakefield, Halifax. And they got all the best performers because they needed the work and they, then they went to those areas. So that's what you're, you're looking for, that pattern of them going to the theatre circuits. I think that is a major clue. With regards to other things in the 18th century, it's very hard very hard. Sarah had several children. I've never managed to trace any baptism for any of them under any name she used. I don't think they baptised, they were keen on baptising children. 
You're almost looking for a gateway ancestor, aren't you? If you find one in the theatre, then think, to oh, help you going through that wheels, tale. Going through wheels can be quite useful. And you're looking for people also of the same name that might be related. So you're looking for that, that network as an in to that particular ancestor. 19th century, of course, it's a lot easier because there's the census, civil registration, there's things like who's who in theatre, there's directories, more packed newspapers available for us at the moment. Yeah, hopefully hopefully those 18th century newspapers will keep coming online. I think so. I think, I think, I think they will. The level of what's on in the Bernie collection, which was one of the most astonishingly useful things that I've, I've ever used. I bet, I bet. Well, I've got one more question for Mesh, but before I ask it, I just thought I'd remind people that if you um, if you want to ask any questions or comments before we wrap up, then please, please do, and I'll try and pop them up. Um, but I just wondered, just to finish, I thought it might be nice, if you could share one of your favourite, a favourite theatrical ancestor or story that you've discovered. Right. No. Um, I can have a minute. <laughs> I have really, to think. I've got sort of single <laughs> sentence. I, I collect funny stories, you see. And I, but I also like quite unusual facts. So one of my stories is how much that they liked using pe people with background actors from actual professions, so the extras on stage. So in one case for um, one production, I can't remember, was it the reprisal? I think it was a rep reprisal. They had to use genuine seamen and sailors. And what they did was they didn't anticipate that they would behave like sailors. <laughs> and they all got their cutlasses out and hacked down the set. So they couldn't. <laughs> I they thought you were going to say something completely different then. <laughs> oh, good. Good, good. I'm glad I didn't go there. <laughs> <laughs> Not stereotype at all. <laughs> so that's one good story and of course in some companies were so short of actors that actors had double up as I was saying earlier but there was one production of Romeo and Juliet where Romeo di didn't have anyone to toll the bell for his death so he had to get up and do it himself <laughs> I went to go see an amateur yeah. dramatic version of the Chronicle of, of Narnia years ago at Portsmouth um, theatre and they they had quite a clever system where the the kids went into the wardrobe and then these young girls dressed in like white kind of nymph like costumes turned the wardrobe round so that they could come out into the um into the uh, winter side but I started thinking this was a very limited budget when it looked like half the girls were in what looked like Anne Summers lingerie it was dreadful <laughs> And it was really inappropriate. And they, they anyway, they they moved this um, moved this wardrobe, and the scene continued and stuff. And then they had that scene, the battle scene, where everybody's lying dead. And I turned around to my friend and went, "They're going to walk off in a minute." And they, <laughs> they did. They but they kind of crept off half half dead, kind of like struggling to stay low. And it was so funny that it was just brilliant. I would I would have paid good money to go see it again because it was just so bad that it was brilliant. So I can I can I can relate to that um Romeo and Juliet having to having to tell his own bell. I, I bet that made the audiences laugh. <laughs> yeah. I think that a lot of Shakespeare did get changed awfully in the 18th century. It wasn't the respect for it now, so they thought that they could min um, manipulate it and move bits around as the at will. It probably wouldn't have resembled the Shakespeare we know. But then everyone, everyone still kind of does that with Shakespeare to a certain yeah. degree. I mean, they don't necessarily change the order, but people play with Shakespeare all the time, don't they? Think of yeah, they don't. Like, I've been to productions where they've cut scenes out, mm. cut scenes out at the beginning. Or they've because there might be more, more than one folio, as we know, folio version. They decided to go with another one, maybe a slightly more non traditional one. Yeah. But I've got yeah, one more we... thing that I want to say with regards to anecdotes. Okay, for it. I like facts. Covent Garden wardrobe was so vast, it ran to 30 pages when it was listed down. This was in 1744. And the theatre manager, John Rich, 
was able to raise a mortgage from its value because it was so big. That's one of my oh, favourites. Wow. Yes. <laughs> I like that. That is a very good fact. Uh, well, thank you so much, Mish, for joining me. Where can thank people you. come and find you and find out a bit more about what you do? And um, and I know you've got your fantastic um, Adcock site as well. Yes, got that. I've got www.abrahamadcock.com. And I'm on Twitter at M-I-S-H-J Holman. I'm also on Facebook at mish.com. Those really are my two places. Okay. Well, I will make sure they are all in the um, accompanying blog post, along with mention of all the resources that we've, um, yes, we've discussed that people can find. Click on a link and take themselves there and, and be transported back to 18th century plays, which sounds like a good place to go to me. So, but um, yeah, thank you very much for your time. I'll do the thank awkward you. thing now where I press that end button and then we're stuck here waving at each other for a minute. <laughs>